But this is an exercise mainly to warm up our imaginations, because what we really do is deal with imaginations from start to bottom. I think that's what hypnotists do more than anything, is deal with imagination. So if everyone take a nice deep breath, close your eyes for a moment, and think of a place where you feel safe and secure. Where do you feel safe and secure? And if you pick your house, be specific. Where in your house do you feel safe and secure? So hang on to those feelings of safety and security. Everyone feels them different. Maybe it's your stomach. Maybe it's your chest. Maybe it's your head. Maybe it's a combination. But just feel those feelings of safety and security. Now many of us would say that we feel loved and nurtured when we're in this place of safety and security. So feel free now to add in that feeling of love and nurture, safety and security. And interestingly enough, usually in a place where you feel safe and secure, loved and nurtured, you feel safe to let go and relax. So hang on to that feeling, safety, security, loved and nurtured. And the ability to let go, be yourself and relax. So we can really, really learn. And as you're adding all that, kind of hang on to it. Just for me, however, I'd like you to think about some of the teachers that you've had that's really impacted your life. They taught you things that you find useful. Maybe they opened up some, some things in you that, you know, to this day you're grateful for. So I'd like you to think of these teachers that you res respect and admire. Really get this image of this person you respect and admire greatly in your mind. Good. Good. So hang on to that safety, security, love, and nurture, the ability to relax and let go. And get that image in your mind of these, this teacher or teachers that you respect and admire greatly. That you've got a lot out of. And maybe even think about some classes you've taken where you've learned so much in a very short period of time. How did that make you feel? Good. Good. And open your eyes. Good. Look up here. All right. Good. I don't just teach NLP, I do NLP. So as you think about those things, just an exercise to get us all going in the same direction, kind of going in the same way. Um, so just a fun little thing to get us started. Well, we're going to be talking about sports and performance. And, you know, it's an interesting field. It really is. It, it, it is. The more I get into this kind of stuff, the hypnosis, the NLP, and, and like all of you in the room, I know that all of you, like me, really find things that, yeah, yeah, see, I keep doing it too. Uh, all of you like me. Um, uh, the fact that you're going to find certain things you like more than others. You know, athlete, athletes are one of my things. I like working with them. I don't know why, I just do. Certain people like working with certain groups. You know, some people like working with kids. How many people like working with kids? Bless you. I'll send everyone I can think of because I don't like working with kids. Um, and look, while I'm honest, I, I, you know, I always say, you know, play to your strengths. Um, but anyway, so we're going to find people that we like to work with or subgroups or things like that. Well, one of the things I found about working with athletes is the athletic mindset is fascinating, you know. And, and the more you learn about it, the more you realize this, this doesn't just have to stick with sports. This basically begins to spill over in everything that we'll be talking about. Um, I promised I'd teach some new stuff today. So I'm going to teach some stuff as we get going uh, that I found quite useful. And, and some interesting stuff. And after we take a break, uh, we come back. I got a little uh, study that was just done on placebos that I'll read to you that was fascinating, if you're interested in that. But um, what I thought, you know, when we get started with athletes, um, how many people work with athletes now? Right? Okay. Those of you that work with athletes, do you find it interesting to work with athletes? Yes. You know? What is it that you find interesting about working with athletes? Just, they solve a lot of problems. They solve a lot of problems? They're motivated. They're, they're, they're motivated. They're a client that usually when you ask them to do something, they do it, correct? I mean, how many of you ever have a weight loss client, give them a tape, say listen to this a couple times during the week, they come back, I had no time to listen to a 25 minute tape in the course of seven days, right? I mean, this is, am I the only one that's ever happened to? Okay, and, but you give something to an athlete, they come back, they wore the thing out. You know, even though you tell them not to, they listen to when they drive, they listen to when they're doing everything. Because they're usually very motivated, which is always fun to get some of those people in your office, those little gym. You know, it's like when you... So, athletes can be fun. But one of the things I found more and more 
about the field of, of neurolinguistics and hypnosis is that much like sports, you really need to master the basics if you're going to move on to the very intricate techniques that, that, that we find so fascinating. You know, I, I'm always fascinated that uh, people want to jump in at the like third degree black belt level. Right? They want to jump in and do some advanced double bind metaphor with super embedded commands and all this other stuff, and they've never put anybody in trance yet. <laughs> you know, where they just say, close your eyes, which is much easier than telling a 35 minute story. Um, but, you know, it's fascinating this has happened, but let's just jump in now. And one of the things about athletes, in the, in the handout I gave you, uh, it says, uh, mind for performance or sports. Steps. Like uh, was said, you got you got two handouts. Everybody got it. Uh, yeah, the athletic mindset. That's the page three. <laughs> are super competitive human beings, okay? What's interesting, when you look at the, at, at the field of sports psychology, it's an interesting little thing that um, in, the, in the early 60s, sports psychology got its start. And what happened was, because of the growth of psychology in general, especially on college campuses, they began to call on psychologists when athletes would have a problem. So it was a, it was a growing field. And much like any growing field, you had some people that got very good at it. Okay? And uh, what was interesting, however, was the split that happened in the late 60s uh, with, with some sports psychology. Because what happened was, all of a sudden, there was a market. And there was a market for, for dealing with athletes. But there were no people trained to deal with the athletes. So a lot of the entrepreneurial types would just jump in there and say, I can do this. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but they were taking clinical psychology skills, especially psychoanalytic skills, and trying to work with athletes. Okay? Now, if you follow me on this, a typical psychoanalytic skill, when the first person shows up, says, you know, that their thing is they are so competitive, when I lose, I want to kill myself. They will try to help remove some of the competitive edge, right? Which doesn't play well with the coach. You know, when a star quarterback is all of a sudden doesn't care if he wins or loses. Doesn't care if I throw five interceptions in this game, because I feel good about myself. Right? So what began to happen was sports psychology got a bad rap. Because you had people out there just doing what, you know, they thought was right. You know, trying to help these people. Or trying to get somebody to totally restructure their personality in psychotherapy when all the coach wanted to do was get the guy on the field. Okay? Now, I, I had the pleasure of, of, of going to a training with a guy named Bruce Ogilvie, who I'll talk about later. The, he's the grandfather of sports psychology. San Jose State University in California. Um, and he talks about what's interesting, and, and, and this is good for everybody in this room, because this is what we do. When, if you ever get to deal with athletes, it's an, you get into an ethical bind at times. And the ethical bind you can get into is this. People, you know, an athlete comes to you, and, you know, you're supposed to help them to the best of your ability. But the ethical bind can happen is if you ever get the pleasure of working with a team, okay, or the coach is the one that brings somebody. Because then technically, the team or your coach is your client. The athlete is just the person you'll be working with. And it's very interesting when they say, I don't care if this person has a complete psychotic break at the end of the season. Just get them through the game. Then what do you do? Now you're a caring, compassionate human being. You want to help the athlete. Well, you may help them. You'll never ever work with that team again or probably any other team. Okay? Because athletes at, at the pro level are interchangeable parts. 
You know, they really don't invest that much in their athletes, other than multi-million dollars if you ever get to that level and work with those people. Other than that, when they're done, next, and they don't really care because it's it's this thing. So as a person coming from our field where we want to help people, we want to do this, it's like, so what do you do now? you got this athlete that has all of these major problems, right? But the team that's hired you, the coach, the team that's hired you, just wants to get them feeling better, get them on the field, get them done. So they can compete at least one more year, right? And, then, and next year is their problem, right? So those are some interesting things. So what happened with, with sports psychology is there was that rift where you had clinicians bringing psychoanalytic skills into the sports world where it really doesn't work as well. Now what's interesting, everyone in this room already has a big jump on most psychologists. Edit that out of the tape, please. Uh, the, which is, hypnosis is one of the best modalities to help an athlete that they have, right? Because you're bypassing all the critical factors of the mind and helping to make the change where they want to make the change anyway. You know, you're not going to do some deep psychoanalytic stuff. You don't really care. You know, they, they have a fear of, suddenly they have a fear of free throws if it's a basketball player. You can go right in and work with that. We don't need to know that, you know, what, whatever happened in his childhood that now led to this deep traumatic fear, you know, in his 30s, whatever it could be. You can go right in and, and, and be very specific. So anyway, the, the, the split began to happen in, in sports psychology that, content, that does continue to this day. You know, there are sports that will never, ever use a sports psychologist. You know, They're, they don't like them because they... They have the attitude that it messes athletes up, right? Because it gets them thinking too much. You know, it makes people get, look for insight, right? Insight's a wonderful thing, but they just want this guy to hit the 95 mile an hour fastball, you know? And they don't want them thinking about whatever's going on in their life. They just want to get them in, get them out. So anyway, but the chasm is starting to close because there are some very good analytic techniques, not analytic techniques, but psychotherapeutic, if you will, hypnosis being, I think, number one, and NLP, of course, interchanged with that, ways to actually help an athlete perform better, lower their stress levels, and actually increase their, their shelf life as an athlete, which is what we're starting to see in the pro world now, right? If anyone sees that, athletes are performing much longer, much better, right? The guy that just... Uh, set the home run record. He, he was he was old for an athlete. What he was in? What, what was he? Thirty seven. Anybody know any baseball fans here? It's not a sport I follow. But wasn't he at, for you know ten years ago? That would that would have been unheard of. Let alone being in the pros. Let alone setting records. You know. And of course in the in the football world, you got guys Jerry Rice, forty years old, setting records. So one of the things they're looking at is extending the shelf life. But let's just jump in and talk about the athletic mindset. Number one. Athletes are super competitive. They're competitive with themselves and they're competitive with others. And it, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that is what they do. They are super competitive. And you, want, you, don't, want to dis, you don't want to take that away. You can, if anything, you want to make them more competitive because that's what drives an athlete to succeed. You know, the, the things we'll talk about later, factors of success. But they're also, what's interesting about top performing athletes, when you look at the real elite athletes, they'll always search the best competition. They'll, in, I don't want to say just innately or intuitively, but they'll look for the competition that gives them the most. You know, A really high performer doesn't want to fight somebody they can beat easily. Right? They really don't. And you see it in the boxing world. I bring that up because you, know, you see the pros... The, usually the, like the champs, they really want to fight guys that are going to make them challenge themselves. Now sometimes their handlers don't want that because they might lose, right? Which will, which will ruin multi-million dollar payday. But the athletes themselves, if you ever talk to some, and being in Vegas, if we were here longer, I'd say go find, there's a lot of boxers who live in Vegas because this is the boxing mecca. Talk to them. They really want to fight people that make them work hard. You know, and so you see that in every sport. The elite performers, the ones that keep going up, they actually look for people that challenge them, right? In basketball, they do it. You know, my, when Michael Jordan was in his prime, there weren't a lot of people that could keep up with him. So he loved to go and play against the few that could. You know, when, when Magic Johnson was still playing or Larry Bird, things like that. He looked forward, he would say that to those games. 
because he had to step his game up a level. You know, when he'd go play another team, he could like, and he would say that, you know, almost take a day off. He'd still score 35 points, do all the things that he would do, but it wasn't challenging to him. And he would talk about in those games, he would challenge himself. He would try some of those things that, you know, made him famous. Things like that, that, you know, they're always trying to do one better themselves. You know, it's also why you see, when you watch sports, um, even team sports, where a team is winning, you see a lot of like college football, right? Like Nebraska is playing some team. And, you know, it's 38 to nothing at the end of the first quarter, right? And somebody said, they ought to just let up on those boys, right? And what happens is the coach puts in the second team. Now it's 56 to nothing at halftime. So he takes out the second team and he puts on the guys that never play. Now, they want to win. They're going to do their best, right? How do you tell them, you know, to lighten up? You know, to, to, to tone down your killer instinct. That's why when you see it in sports, the, you know, you see it in college football and, and basketball more than any other, you know, 73 to 2. And they're upset. That you shouldn't have let them score those two points. You know, they get really upset about that. It's that super competitive killer instinct mindset that athletes have. Okay? Not everybody has it. But by the way, and then I'm going to tie this in later, what they're starting to find, that mindset is the mindset for success in every endeavor. Right? When you look at the people that climb to the top of a corporation, they have a lot of the same mindsets and a lot of the same, what they, we're going to talk about competitive styles profile, the people that fit that are the same ones that, you know, if they had the physical skills, they could have been a pro athlete. But they probably didn't have the physical skills, but they have the mindset to go and do whatever it is they got to do to become a Lee Iacocca or a Bill Gates. It's the same, it's the same mindset. You know, Bill Gates talks, to, talks about it from the business world. What was his intention? Not just to make a big computer, it was to dominate the computer industry. His entire dream was with every computer system in the world to run his systems. Right? That was his, and he talked to this day, and he doesn't understand why Congress keeps wanting to pull him back. Well, you can't do this. It's like, well, that's my job. You know, we, you know, let's destroy the competition. You know? It's just interesting, because I'm listening to it from a different framework, and it's like, makes sense to me. You know, if I open a practice, I, I want to, if I open a practice in your town, you wouldn't like me. I'd run full page ads. I'd be on television, you know? I mean, it's, 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 it's in my mindset. It's like, I just don't want to do well. I want to win, you know? And so it, it, it's just overwhelming that goes on. And they have internal and external motivators. Athletes naturally have internal and external motivators, you know? They'll look to their coach or, or the competition for some external motivation, but they always have that internal drive to do their best, right? Uh, even if, and, and again, to go back to sports, you see it with athletes when they're, they're playing a game, they're doing well. I mean, they're doing great. And then they do one little thing wrong, and they're, they're like, they have a tizzy. I don't know what a tizzy is, but that's what they have. You know, they go off on a, on a tangent, things like that. And it's because they have that, that internal and external strive for success. You know, I was watching a game, the Oakland Raiders, and... Uh, the, uh, the quarterback, Rich Gannon, set the record, 22 straight completions. It was a fascinating thing to watch. It was like, it was precision in action if you're a football fan. But when he missed, the, the, on the 23rd, I think it was the 23rd, uh, you know, he threw the pass, the guy dropped it. Do you think he was like, well, at least I set a record. <laughs> you know, he snapped his helmet off, you know, he's like screaming and doing this. But that's his mindset. You know, he wants to do perfection in every play. That's what got him to wherever, wherever it was. You know, so that. Athletes always have a winning attitude. They have an in intense desire to succeed. And when I say that, I mean an intense desire to succeed. And what an intense desire to succeed basically begins to point out is they will do just about anything to succeed. You know, and they can take it to the... To, to limits we, we can talk about in a little while, but they, they naturally have an intense desire to succeed. Okay? And this is where we can help when we talk about how to help athletes, but they, they have that internal drive. They'll, they'll lift the weights the extra hour to succeed. They'll do the extra running. They'll, you, you see it 
the higher up you go, the more naturally you see it. You know, people, if any, if any of you have ever been lucky enough to see professional athletes, how hard they work, it's fascinating. You know, hours and hours on the practice field to run like one route. I always think of football. I got to work with some football. The, the, you don't think that they would, you know, they, they've been in the game forever, you know, since they're a little kid. And, you know, and here they are. They're still out there for hours and hours just practicing one movement to get it down path, you know. And, and that comes from an intense desire to succeed on the inside. Yes, ma'am. Question. No. She said, is there a difference between competitiveness, winning over others, and, and what was the last set? Pursuit of excellence. Pursuit of excellence. No. No, I think it, they're finding out they all begin to intertwine. At least that's what some of the, you know, stuff that they're beginning to say. Yeah. Both athletes and musicians talk about creating muscle memory. Oh. And there's um, muscle memory. Study out Oh yeah. Free throws, and that those uh, athletes were actually more successful at improving their performance than mm -hmm. the people who spent the extra hour and just practice um, And my son's a musician, and I, I do work with musicians quite a bit. Could you comment on that? Yeah, bring that up at the end. So that's you're ahead of me here. So, well, yes, ma'am. Then we'll get rolling. Oh, the difference between team sports and individual sports. A slight difference, but not much, because they're still competing. You know, they'll always look for a competition. But we'll, we'll talk about muscle memory. So the question was about team sports and, and individual sports. We'll talk a little bit about that. But um, so athletes have all this and, and, and more. But what I wanted to jump into is uh, a study that was done, it was not a study, there's a test. It's called a competitive styles profile. And what it does is it gives you the mental mindset and it breaks it down into some very specific things. Um, I'll just tell you about it. And, and it's a psychotropic instrument, psycho, psychometric. So you're supposed to be a psychologist to do these, okay? But we can talk about what they are because what they do is they break things down into two things. And then I'll, we're going to talk about the competitive styles profile and the learning styles profile and how you can help athletes with, with this kind of stuff. But what's interesting is they broke this down, the competitive styles profile, broke it down into, into a few things that they found quite successful for, to, to measure athletes. And what it was is, is they broke it down into things like um, concentration, determination, uh, orientation, and mental toughness. Because when you look at high performing athletes, and, and one of the baselines that Dr. Ogilvie kept looking at was multiple gold winners in the Olympics. Okay? Multiple Pro Bowl players in the NHL, the NFL, and the NBA. The people that go multi all pro. You know, not just once, but it, it becomes something more than a chance event that they had a good year. So what he found was that these people, they all score very high on these factors. Determination, um, which breaks down into concentration, orientation, poise, and mental toughness. Uh, no. This is what I'm just going to talk about. And I'll tell you where you can find some of the info. Because like I say, it's a psychometric instrument. Um, but what they do is mental toughness is probably the biggest thing that high-performing athletes have, okay? And what I mean by mental toughness, according to this, is across the board, they will have the ability to tough out things. And they're not sensitive to criticism, feedback, or it, they're, they're just not sensitive. It's mentally tough. Things roll off their back, right? And they can put things in perspective, right? One of the great things that you see, and I ask that you, if you don't believe me, start watching this. Watch like a really good pro athlete when they talk about certain things, right? Um, 
And I was thinking in, in the, I think it was mid-90s, when the Chicago Bulls were winning all their titles uh, in Chicago, and I was living there. Uh, they were interviewing Michael Jordan, and they were asking him one of the, it was after one of the games, and he would talk about all the, they asked him, you know, how did you do this, why did you do that? He said, well, I did this when this happened, you know, and whatever, I'm not a big basketball fan. But, you know, he talked about that. It was all very, he was very associated into the experience, is what I'm saying. His body's movement as he's talking about it, right? Then there was a game that all athletes have, eventually. He didn't do too well, right? You know, eight points, blew a couple free throws, actually missed the shot at the end of the game, right? And they lost the game, which is rare, but it does happen. But they started talking to him about that. And interestingly, now uh, there he is, and there's no handlers around him. He says, well, I'm only going to talk about this game one time. And after, after tonight, I'm never talking about this game again. Then he clicks into it. Then he asks him a question. He goes, well, even Michael Jordan can do this. They ask him, well, well why did you do that? He goes, no, no, no. Well, he totally disassociated from the experience. You know, and I don't think you, th this was a learned behavior. I think it was innate. That's maybe that's one of the things naturally high performers do. He associates into the successes, instantaneously disassociates from bad things, right? But he did say, "I, I will learn." You know, he learned a couple things from it, right? But that little instant switch from going from totally associated when he has a good game, which is good, because when you're going to step into the next game, do you? Want to, you know, who do you think would be more successful? The guy that's stepping on the court, whether it's basketball court, a, a tennis court, or a, uh, uh, whatever it is that they're doing, if they're only thinking about how good they are and how easy they can perform and how natural this is to win or whatever it is that they do. Or the guy that right before he gets started is thinking, oh my God, the last time I did this, I did this, I did that. You know, I dropped the ball, I couldn't do this. Who's going to be more successful? I mean, wouldn't it naturally be the person that steps on there that oozing that confidence? You know? Things like that. Um, so, that, that mental toughness, you know, and the reason I bring that up is if you're working with athletes, especially young athletes, right, this is something that can be coached into people. Right? And unfortunately, most coaches aren't very good at it. You know? You get some person... Um, that maybe they don't in innately have this mental toughness and they, they drop the ball, right? And they come off the field and there's the coach, right? Anybody ever had this experience, you know? And then the coach is like being caring, compassionate, loving. <laughs> you know, they're twisting football, they're twisting your face mask, they're breaking the clipboard over your head, calling you every name they can possibly think of, right? If, if you don't have that innate mental toughness, you may not be an athlete very long, right? Does this make sense to everybody? So this is something that, whether the coaches are ever going to learn this or not, I don't know. They seem to. Good coaches seem to innately know how to work with certain athletes. But something that we can do is we can help install mental toughness in people, right? Why can't we? I mean, this is, this is something that we do, right? So we can help people, you know, put them in trance and talk about developing that thick skin. You know, like, a, you know, let it roll off. You know, take the, take the criticism that you need, but, you know, as um, was said yesterday, the subconscious mind takes things personal. So, you know, coach would be screaming, don't take this personal, but you're an idiot. You can't do this, you can't do that, you know, and all this other stuff. Well, of course you're taking it personal. Unless maybe some people have that innate ability. So one of the things we can do is develop that mental toughness. The other thing is... Uh, the ability to activate. And what I mean by that is all high-performing athletes have the ability to get themselves up for the game. What's fascinating when, uh, for what we do as hypnotists, you know, uh, we act like we should hide hypnosis from the athletes because they might be scared of it, right? Because maybe it's too woo-woo or whatever they're going to talk. Now, you're talking about people that won't change their socks the entire time they're having a good streak. <laughs> You know, uh, they won't wash their gear before a tournament if they're doing well, because it might break the spell or whatever. You know, it might you bring some bad mojo or whatever. I mean, these are and these are like guys that, of course, you start trying to talk something metaphysical, they're going to freak out. But they'll do these other strange rituals, right? But that's okay. 
right? So, but, you know, the natural athletes, the really good ones, they can get themselves up for the game. You know, the coach doesn't have to motivate them, right? And I know we get some athletes in the room, when you think about people, they don't need the coach to yell at them. They're already vibrating before they start, right? They're naturally up when they get started. Does this make sense to everybody? Yes, David, you got, do you think, Doc, do you think Dr. Damon had to give uh, Don Mott a pep talk? <laughs> right? He was vibrating as he came up to the front of the room. I mean, he got himself up for it. And speaking is a performance art. I mean, speaking is. So they get, whatever they do, you know, they do, but they'll naturally do it. Now, some you need some external stuff, but not really. Really high-performing athletes just do this naturally. And again, this is something hypnotists can do. We can, we can help install this idea of getting yourself up for the game, doing whatever you need to do to get up for the game, without going to the point where you got to go throw up all the time. Right? But, you know, but they, you want to get yourself the ability to activate. Um, a couple other things I know that we can help athletes with is focus. Focus and, and, and the ability to not be distracted. Naturally high-performing athletes can do a couple other things. And, and one is they, they have no external distractibility is what the, this one test measures. So when they get started on a task, they can focus on the task at hand. And they can basically block out you know, as we would say in hypnosis, screen out external stimuli, right? It's not happening. Now, if you think about it, you have to be able to do that in certain sports, in almost all sports, right? Do you think Tiger Woods has this when he's going up to make a putt and there's, what, 3,000 people standing around him, the cameras are there, you know, and everybody's whispering. I don't know why they whisper on a golf course. It's not like you could really hear it, but it wasn't fascinating me. Why do the guys in the truck that are a mile away whisper? As he's lying up the putt. wonder those things. But it's scary in here, ladies and gentlemen. I, I do nothing about this. Um, but they can screen out that external stimuli. You know, they, they're not distracted. They're focused on the task at hand. You know, and again, that, that's what rituals do. You know, and that's why athletes have rituals. I don't know what Tiger Woods is, but you see baseball players do it all the time. He used to be a hypnotist in Florida. He would teach guys that they would just do this. This was their little signal. They take a few deep breaths, and you'd see him standing on the on the batting cage, getting ready to go up. Because again, there's fifty thousand drunken fans in the stands, screaming, hollering, doing this. True, Tiger Woods' father is a I, I'm sure it is. Probably. But he's they're doing this, right? He said this Tiger Woods day out of hypnotist. Right? He's a heck of a motivator. Um, but whatever the task, so they they don't screen out. And the one that fascinates me uh, is in the NBA when they went to the glass backboards. Right? Have you ever seen this? I'm not, like I said, I'm not a big basketball fan. But there's a guy lining up, you know, and there's all these they're waving stuff. Wet. They're waving stuff, you know, they're doing that, you know. And the, it, it, fascinating. And then they're lining up just to make the free. They've got to be non-distracted. You know, girls will be flashing them. <laughs> in Chicago, it was pretty brutal when the, when the Bulls were playing. But it's like, you know, I mean, these guys just line up. It's like nothing. You know, that that's, that's, that's. They have no external distractibility. Does this make sense to everybody? You know, football, you know, anybody... I did have the, the pleasure one time to go to, the, to an Oakland Raider game. And if you're a football fan, you ever seen Raider Nation? You know, these guys dress up like Darth Vader, you know, and they have all this stuff on, and, and you find out they're bank presidents and stuff later on. But, you know... And they say, we're scary. It's hypnotism. But... You know, there's the, there's the athletes, they get into it. They're totally, they, it's like it's not there, okay? So you have, and this is something we can help people, this is something we can really help people do, right? Because mo you can teach this. This is a skill that's easily teachable with hypnotic, with, with, with hypnosis, is to, the, that ability to focus, you know, to screen out external stimuli. People do it naturally when they read. You know, if you're a reader, you do it. You may not be an athlete, but if you're if you if you can get into a good fiction work, do you screen out external stimuli? That's why people read at airports. Do you lose track of time? Right? Do you does your body respond? So if you're reading a Stephen King novel, you get scared, right? A happy story, you get happy. You read a Harlequin romance novel, <laughs> your body responds, correct? I mean that's a trance. 
Yes, ma'am. I saw a Cirque du Soleil, the O, last night, and I think that's the most incredible example of focus because they're not doing anything that is they're in the air. Oh. They're just hanging by their ankles. It's, they're not on the ground. Like the football oh. players, at least are on the ground. Right. Well, I, you never talked to them. They can see <laughs> that yeah. focus with oh, the yeah. audience and lights and sounds and everything around. Well, for, yeah, acting, they're, all I mean, performing. They're athletes yes. as well as performers. Oh, yeah, it all starts to spin together, you know. Uh, you must be in a trap the whole time. Oh, yeah. Come to Florida and do the trapeze experience when we do that. You know, we do this trapeze thing. Um, but the, yeah, so that, that, that ability to focus, you have to be able, and not just like, thanks for bringing that up, not just sports, right? Performing artists have to do it. Uh, musicians have to be able to do it. Uh, speakers have to be able to do it. Anybody ever do stage shows? Right, when you do a stage show, what do you do? You start your pre-talk then, you always get those few people that are talking. Right? I just did a show a few weeks ago at Florida Atlantic University, and they you know, they hadn't had a hypnotist in a long time, so they didn't know how to act. And, and these are college kids, so they don't know how to act. And, but their they're group over there, they're talking. And I start my pre-talk. And it was like, you know, I had to shut it off. Because I knew if I gave them attention, then, you know, it, the show was over. Right? So I just kept, eventually they shut up. But I had to, because someone else was there, said, so I just kept talking. I was focused on the task at hand. So athletes have to do it, performers. Like I say, this isn't just sports. All this stuff begins to spill over. The other thing athletes, elite athletes do, besides be able to screen out external stimuli, is they have no internal distractibility. They are able to shut off their thoughts. Right? They are able to shut off their thoughts. Right? How many times, and you don't have to be a big sports fan to, to think of this. Think about how many times you ever heard an athlete say, I'm thinking too much. Right? They say it all the time. Once they think, they're dead. Whatever, whatever sport they're in, because sports move so fast, you cannot think quick enough to keep up. It's physical impossibility. And the military is trained, starting to study this because we're getting to the limits of human performance. Right? You got a, I don't, I don't say, you got a Navy captain back there, but the Air Force and the Navy pilots, they are, when they're in that jet, they're flying at like Mach 2.5, right? They, are think, they have to think three point something miles ahead. Because by the time they move their hand, they're three miles away. So, and it's an interesting thing to start thinking about. They, you, they cannot think, they can only react. Right? And athletes, performers, all that, they have to shut that part of their mind off and go with what we do best. The subconscious mind, or the pre-conscious mind, whatever you want to call it, because that's where it is. Because a couple of years ago, when you did the baseball thing, when there was the home run derby between uh, Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa, anybody remember that? Anybody follow that? Anyway, you know they're talking. Whatever they're talking, I can't do the the accent that Sammy does, but they were talking to him about you know what he's doing, and and, and he was on one of those hitting streaks, and he hit like 20 home runs. He's doing this. He's hitting just he's just talking, you know, I mean, I'm just hitting everything, and they ask him about it, and he goes, I, I can't do the accent, well, he goes, the ball, like, going very slow, and it's this big, that's, that's exactly what he did with his hands, I'm thinking, I'm not much of a baseball player, but if it's going slow, and it's this big, I can probably hit it, <laughs> right, and then he goes, but then you get into those streaks, where it's like a little bitty BB, and it goes like that, <laughs> and he goes, so what you have to do is not think. Because if you really understand the physics of baseball, they have to start the swing as the ball is leaving the pitcher's hands. Right? Because it's not that far away, 66, and 66 feet, 6 inches. And they're throwing a ball 95 miles an hour. You can't swing a bat that fast. They're, and then we get into, are their minds in sync? Do, do maybe, this is, what, this is where I want to take this stuff. Do the really elite, like baseball players in that, are they tapped into, I know what you're doing? I know where the ball's going, because I can't think that fast. It's physically impossible. So am I tagged into the energy enough? And as a martial artist, we talk about that stuff enough. I know where you're going to punch, so I just... Yeah. So does this make sense to every... I get off on this stuff. So this, you know, now my mind's off on a tangent, so excuse me. So, yes? Do you have specific techniques you use to install these things? Oh, yeah. yeah. We'll get to that. I'm going to do some stuff. 
But anyway, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're an alpha female. Jeez, you're going to come up here and rip my throat out. Okay, now. I love alpha. Now, with it, whatever I was saying, it was true. So, that's the point. So, you have to be able to think that fast. So, you have to shut off the internal thoughts. Right? Right? And we got some martial artists here, I know. Right? When you're doing your forms in martial arts, are you thinking when you do them? You don't want to be thinking at that point. You're, you're, it's there, right? It just, it flows. And that's when you do the really <coughs> elegant stuff. And all sports does it. All performance does that, you know? And for a speaking, which I would consider that, it's a fine line of thinking a little bit, but going with the subconscious mind. So, and um, the other thing that athletes, with the internal ability to not get distracted, the other thing, it, it, that athletes, elite performers of all types can do is um, not deviate from the script. Their pre-programmed script. There are, and they seem to intuitively, now I'm going to get, give you a paradox here. <coughs> they seem to intuitively know when there are times they cannot deviate from the script or the play or whatever and the time that it's okay to free flow. And this is something that as, as hypnotists and stuff, I think we can start to explore. I, I wonder, and I know Ogilvy and that, they're, they're trying to figure out, can they test for that internal creativity? Where, you know, there, there are times you don't want to deviate from the script because it's going to work. The play will work the way it's ran, right? And, you know, but then there are times you're going to have to free flow. Does this make sense to everybody? And this is something that maybe we can help people with or not, right? But... It's an interesting little um, paradox. Now, what I thought we would do is um, so those are some things with the with, with, with that, that that the mental focus. Well, I don't want to get too much on that. I want to actually give you guys something to do. Um, the other thing, now here's something that we can actually help people with, and it's in your handout. Woohoo! And it's called, it's, it's called the Learning Styles Profile. Okay? And in your book, let me find it. Hold on. Understanding Learning Style. Okay? I just worked on Focus Trainer. You know, now obviously, you know, we learn in three modes, visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. That's basically how people learn, right? You can only, every thought, everything that you do goes through one of the, one of the five senses. You either see something, hear something, physically feel something, or internally feel something, smell or taste. That's it. That's all your brain can process, right? If you're a psychic, you actually get your, your psychic abilities. You either see it or hear it or feel it. Sometimes maybe you smell it. I don't know. Any smelling psychics in the room? Right? Yeah, well, don't we say things that smells funny to me? Yeah, yeah whatever. Or tastes funny, whatever. But, um, but that's how you think. Those things come through. But athletes, they either see it, they need to see it to learn it, they either need to hear it to learn it, or they need to feel it to learn it. Now, most athletes, and this is a big jump, okay, a lot of your athletes, seems like intuitively, learn kinesthetically, right? They, they need to do this, whatever it is that they're doing, right, to feel it. Now, everyone in the room, you're all a little different. So what is your preference? How do you like to learn? Do you need to see it, you know? Do you need to have, have it explained to you? Or do you need to just do it? Okay? Maybe, excuse me. Maybe you need a little bit of all of it, but you have a preference, right? Now, the reason I'm bringing that up, this can... This can really increase your effectiveness across the board with everybody, right? A lot of us in the field are very kinesthetic, right? That's what brings us in the field. We're feeling people. We want to help people to feel better, right? And then a lot of us do that, right? So now what if somebody comes in and they just say, you know, I look at my life and all I see is a mess. So you being the caring, compassionate person goes, how do you feel about that? And they go, I don't know. I don't really feel anything. It just looks like crap. And then you go, we need to explore those feelings. 
Now, at that point, absolutely no communication has happened, nor will it ever, because they're not speaking the same language. Now, for athletes, the same thing happens. You know, hopefully, God willing, you know, you get a coach that can teach you the way you need to learn. You know, if you're a very kinesthetic person and you're lucky enough to get a coach that wants to walk you through everything, so it's touch, 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 right? And so you get a feel for whatever it is. Okay? Now, the, but what if you get a coach that wants to talk constantly? Right? They can't, they can't translate it. Or whatever it might do. They're going to just show you everything, but they don't. So one of the things is every person you deal with, an athlete, you might want to begin to ask them some questions. You know, just have them write down, like, uh, one thing I found, I mean, you can do this whole test thing, or you can ask them to write down, you know, just write a little paragraph about the most relaxing thing you've ever done. And then read what they write. And look for the words. Did they say, you know, well, you know what they saw? It's that simple. I mean, this stuff is not rocket science, right? It is so simple if you keep it simple. They will tell you exactly what's going on in their head. They'll tell you what is their prim primary preference. Okay? So if they're very visual, obviously you want to talk visual words. You want to, you want to match their words, as Maurice was saying yesterday, because that will get you in a level of rapport. Okay? Or kinesthetic. Whatever it is that you're dealing with, that's fine. But for athletes, you can begin to train them to open up all of their senses. So if I'm kinesthetic, it, it's very easy for me, and this is something we can do with hypnosis, and you can just be creative with this to do it, put them in trance and say, so a coach is explaining to you what to do, you can go inside and feel it, what you need to do. Or if a coach showing, you know, they're telling you what to do and I need to picture it in my head, I can listen to the hearing words and make a movie. You see the naturally good athletes, especially when you get into the pro level, they have to be able to do this. You know? And again, I always think of pro football because there are times, you know, yeah, they're going to run the plays, run the plays, but then you see them on the sky, sidelines and they're sketching stuff out. And, you know, and again, I, I think of the, this last year, I was watching the thing, you know, and uh, a Raider game. And there's Rich Gannon comes off the sideline and the coach is talking to him. And, and, it, and you, basically, you didn't have to be a rocket science NLP people to figure out this one. You know, the coach is talking, and, and Gannon does. So then he takes a clipboard and he draws it out. And Gannon goes like this, he looks at it, and he, and he looks up, if anybody's following what I'm doing here, and he does a couple movements with his body, and that was it. And I'm sitting there watching, and I go, okay, he's probably primarily a visual learner, but he needs a kinesthetic check. You know, his coach is telling him what to do, he just couldn't, he, he was like, you know, in the heat of the game, all this other, the adrenaline's pumping, all that. So they sketched it out. I think, I mean, they could have been talking about where they're going to dinner, for all I know. But, you know, and then he, then he probably ran the movie in his head, and he did something in his body, and then he was fine. And then he went and he talked to the receivers, and, and, and they went back out, you know, on the next, whenever they went back out. But good athletes can learn this, as all of us can. I think that's one of our jobs as as hypnotist is become to become what they call trimodal. You should be a trimodal person. Which means it doesn't matter if you're you're kinesthetic and you're visual, I should I should be able to switch when I'm talking to you. Right? To go back to that stupid example, you know, where why should I try to make my client become kinesthetic? You know, the guy hasn't had a feeling in forty years. Maybe he'll never have one and that's fine. You know, he's in there because he wants to make his life look better. Fine, we'll, we'll do what we can. You know, now if I feel like it, I could probably go in there and, you know, get him to access some feelings because he's, he's doing it anyway. He's just not aware of it probably. But I need to be able to slip slip into going to his mode to become trimodal. And so as you begin to learn this, you can actually take your athletes into it, you know, and help them learn how to do this. Okay? Does this make sense to everybody? Okay. Good. Um, no, Mr. E, are we supposed to take a quick break? Huh? Would you guys like a five-minute break to get rid of your coffee and get more coffee? Let's take five minutes and no more, and then we're going to...
There was some interesting research I just got the other day before I left the house, and it's on placebos. And one of the things is um, about the effectiveness of placebos. Um, placebos and active analgesics are more effective when presented with a well-known brand name. Okay, so uh, placebo injections are more effective than placebo pills. Right. The color, this is what I want to get to, the color of a placebo can influence its effects, okay? Um, when administered without information, and whether they are stimulants or depressive, blue placebo pills produce depressive effects. Whereas red placebos induce stimulant effects, okay? And patients report falling asleep significantly quicker after taking a blue pill than taking a red, blue, or green placebo. Okay? It's fascinating when you think about it. Okay? And then there's an abstract. Uh, if anybody's interested, I get you the name of the guy that wrote it. It was Steve Andreas, one of the big guys in NLP. I'm on his mailing list. And, uh, but he has an abstract on a study done by the uh, U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, Federal Death Administration. Um, <laughs> The, uh, the, uh, the, uh, but it was a, it was a, it was a meta-analysis that those of you that remember your science classes, meta-analysis on, uh, the effectiveness of antidepressants, things like Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, uh, Cerazone, all these, uh, um, a whole bunch of them. Uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. God, now we sound like we're in a medical conference, don't we? Uh, but basically what it said is that 80% of the response to the medication was duplicated in placebos. And that the effectiveness of, of, of psychotropic medication is minimal at best. You know, and that the risks far outweigh the benefits. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Um, uh, well, this was a study done by, I'll get it to you, it's up here. Um, it, it's just interesting. And the, yes, I don't know. I'm a hard guy. Anyway. Anyway, it's just some interesting studies, you know, that, that, that are fascinating when you get into it. Because it always leads to my biggest question. If a person ODs on placebos, do they only think they're dead? Okay. Now. Um, okay. What I thought we'd do now is one of the other things. We did some, some, some background stuff and... and a little bit of research and all that. But what I thought we'd do is a, a technique. Let's do a technique so you guys can actually leave here with something. Okay? I like to actually, at least then, you have one little technique you can actually take and do something. And what I thought I'd do is this. Because another thing athletes have a tendency to talk about, and it's a naturally occurring thing for most athletes, um, is the experience of altered time. They get into time distortion, right? Time just slows down, disappears, becomes unimportant. You know, you hear him talk about, like, the baseball player, like I said, where the ball's going very slow, right? The ball is probably still traveling at 90-something miles an hour, but it seems slow. Uh, whatever it is, when you're in the zone, it feels different. Athletes always talk about the zone, right? And the zone has several levels, but one of them is that altered sense of, of time, where you seem to have five or six speeds on the inside, and the other people only have one. You know, Michael Jordan talked about he had all four gears. He could speed up, slow down, do this. And everybody else was stuck. You know, after, they just talk about it across the board. Now, if that's true, again, the, the more elite athlete, the more they can replicate that ability, right? The difference is the consistent application of this state. Can they get up for it at will? So, okay, they can enter into it, okay? So, it's called the zone. Well, one of the things that this zone has is that altered sense of time. 
Now, since we know that, can we artificially induce this state in people? Can we artificially do a zone kind of experience? Well, we should be able to, right? If you ever deal with an athlete, it's easy. They can think about a time they were in the zone, and they can tell you about it, okay? But if you've never had that experience, it's a little different. But you've all had the altered sense of time, I guarantee it. Have you ever been at a party where time flew? You're having a blast. Time just, you know, hours went by like that, right? Or a very interesting class where, oh, my God, it's just, you know, it's just over before you knew it. Obviously not this one right now, but usually a class where you're really into it and boom, you're like, do you, you ever have that experience? That's a fast time experience, right? Do you ever have one of those where it just drags, you know? Where time just slows, waiting at the dentist's office, right? The last leg of a long trip home. Do you ever notice the last 60 miles if you drive a long way is like pulling teeth, right? You get that altered sense. Now, this is across the board. People talk about it. And, you know, as long as you use regular words, people have no problem. You know, in the last, like I said, in the last, when did I start doing that again? Three or four years ago? I do those, uh, some of you hate these, but I do them, I'll admit it. These uh, stop smoking weight loss seminars, you know, the run around the hotels kind of stuff. So I probably hypnotize, like I say, over eh, 50 to 60,000 people, I would imagine. But one of the things I like to do when I'm doing that is test a lot of this theory that we get. You know, all these people write this wonderful theory. What really seems to work with the average person? As I say, Joe Lunchbox, right? The guy that's going to throw down 50 bucks to quit smoking or lose weight. He doesn't care that I've written books or I've done this other stuff. He just wants to make a change. What seems to work in their mind? Um, and that's one of the interesting things about doing this kind of stuff is you can gather good information. And even people that aren't athletes can relate to this one. But what we want to do is access, you know, a time that time flew or fast time, okay? You had fast experience, okay, where time was flying. Now, uh, I need a volunteer. Let's get the alpha female up. That's how I get volunteers. Oh, do you, if you don't want to volunteer, you don't have to. Would you like to volunteer? Yeah, we're gonna. You want to step into? The, oh no, no. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to break the board? Okay. Oh, that would. Come on, stand up here. All right, stand over here. Have you ever had a time in your life when time went fast? Okay. And and can you close your eyes? I'm gonna touch you on the shoulder if that's okay. Can you close your eyes and think about a time where time went fast? Yeah, you're having a good time. Time's flying. Got one? Now, when you think about that, the first thing I want you to do is kind of keep your eyes closed. Step into the experience, okay? Was your vision, like, real open, or were you real focused on one thing? Focused. Were the colors bright and sharp, or, like, muffled and dull? Right? Uh, were, are things moving, or do they seem still? Okay. Um, anything else you can notice about the vision when you what you see? Maybe, maybe not. Doesn't matter. Okay. What about sounds? What are sounds like? Are they muffled or sharp or, or loud or quiet? What do you hear when you're in this fast time? Internal. So what are you hearing on the inside? Singing. singing. Okay, good. So hear that singing. Okay, great. Now, what about feeling? Where would you say your center is when you're in this fast time experience? Right there. Right there? Okay, good. About your solar plexus. Good. So you have all that. So you feel that. Anything else you feel? Like energetic? Oh, yeah. Okay, okay, you're, okay, good. All those feelings of being in fast time. Now let me ask you just a quick question. What color pops in your mind when you think of fast time? Green, so green, great, great. Kind of shake that off. Open your eyes, look around the room. Good, now close your eyes. Can you think of a time where time dragged a little bit? Yeah, it just looks like, yeah. Just, time just seemed to drag. Okay. Waiting for something. <coughs> Come on. Okay. Got it? Got it? Kind of 
step into that experience. And as you're stepping into that experience, I'm going to touch again, uh, this slow time, well, what's the, what do you see? Great. Great. What uh, is things moving still? Slow. Slow? Colors? No? Great. Okay. What do you what do you hear? Do you hear anything? Low bass. Bass. Okay. okay. And what do you what do you feel in slow time? Decrease, okay, decrease density. Great, so you have all that, great. And what color does represents slow? Gray, gray, gray. Now, can I open your eyes? Great. Now, close your eyes. Let's do an interesting thing. Now, as an athlete, you've hit the zone several times, right? And would you like to be able to enter it more at this will? Just do that, great. So what I want you to do is this. I want you to go in and make it green on the inside. So your center's right there around your solar plexus. You're hearing that music. Man, things are... And your brain is just fast. I mean, yours, it's fun. You're having a great time. Great, great, great. Now, what I would like you to do is you're green on the inside. I'd like you to make it gray on the outside, okay? So you're gray on the outside. Everything on the outside seems to slow down, okay? Now, what I'd like you to do is go ahead and either make a fist or an okay sign. Give yourself some kind of little anchor, we'll call it. Got one? Good. Yeah, yeah. So it's you're fast on the inside, slow on the outside. It's the same thing as the zone experience. So one more time, make it green and gray, and it may do something, and then fire your anchor. Good. Oh, All right, good. Now stay in that, stay in that. Now open your eyes. Good. Now look around the room. Does it seem a little different? Yeah? It's kind of a slow crowd, eh? <laughs> good. Good. Give her a hand. Thank you. Very fast. It's very fast. You can do this very fast. It, it doesn't take but a moment. Um, what we're going to do, I want you to actually practice this. And you can have this for the rest of the day. Where all you do is exactly that. Have the, and this is in your books, the, the, the zone experience, correct? Mm -hmm. Fast time, slow time? Okay. You just have the person think of a time they went fast. Okay? And because time is of the essence, just real quick, close your eyes, think of a time time went fast. And just have them ask those questions. What did you see? What did you hear? What did you feel? And then what color pops in their mind? Okay? Whatever color it is. I just remember I worked with this big, huge guy. Played, he was a lineman in college, right? And he did this. And I said, what color pops in your mind? And he went, and I go, what? He goes, I can't use that color. I go, what color? Pink. <laughs> and I went, maybe you're just man enough to enjoy pink. I had no idea what I was saying at that point. But it's whatever color pops into your mind. Okay? And then... And then just have them think of that. And then have them think of a slow time, just like it says. Time drag, waiting in a uh, doctor's office, airline flight, and then slow. And then what you're going to have them do is mix and match, where you're fast on the inside, slow on the outside. That is the zone experience if you're an athlete. It's, it's, it's kind of artificially installed, but what, what your brain will do, interestingly, it will go in and look for that experience. And if you've never had it, you've just installed it in somebody, but most of you, you've had it sometimes. Performing, performing artists enter this all the time. They're there, okay? So let's just do that real quick. I mean like three minutes each, okay? Then just give them an anchor, like make a fist or an okay sign so they can have this zone experience. Just with the person right next to you, just kind of do it. I'll, I'll tell you when a couple minutes are so you have to switch. So do it really fast. No, you just do it sitting down.
One of the questions people ask about sports, about working with athletes, is they have this idea that they have to understand the game, the sport, the competition that you'll be helping the athlete with. In other words, like you must somehow master whatever it is you're going to help the person do. Well, if that's the case, you know, the mental health business would be gone. <laughs> now, I like that joke myself, but, you know, I used to work in the mountain health center. Uh, the only difference between the inmates and the staff is who has the keys. Um, but I honestly think it's the opposite. I think you do better with athletes than if it's not your sport of specialty. You know, I work great with golfers and hockey players. I don't like the game of golf, personally. I mean, I don't understand it. And everybody says, well, you ought to try it. I don't know why. I just, you know, I'd rather break something. You know? <laughs> but, it's just, no, no, no. But I work well with them. But, you know, they show up. They know what they need. And I'm working with the process. You know, not necessarily the content. You know, golfers show up for, with, with a whole list from their, from their golf pro. You know, if you want to get a referral, do what the golf pro says, or their golf coach, right? Um, same with hockey players. I work with some guys in the NHL. Great athletes. Great this. I don't play hockey. You know, I don't, I, I've seen a couple games, you know? But we're talking about the competitive mindset, and they know what they need, right? And so, and the other thing that happens, you don't contaminate your work if you really don't understand it. You know, you're doing... More, I think, in one way, a little bit, maybe it's my own rationalization of it, but it, it's a good one. It works for me. Now, so you really don't have to understand the sport because, especially if you're working with process, you know, like, you start talking to them, what do they need? And they'll tell you exactly what they need. You know, they need to be more competitive. They need to practice harder. They need to not think so much. These are the general things athletes present with, you know, or they have a little block of some type that was probably installed by a coach, you know, and it probably was not well-meaning, but coaches say things like, you'll always fumble when the time comes. <laughs> oh, interesting, and you know, you know, they, guess what? You know, they come off the field, I love watching this, people say they don't understand it, they'll see some kid come off the field after a horrible play, right? Now, would you say he's in an altered state? Yes. Especially, if, I was thinking football, they just got whacked big time, so they're physically in an altered state too. And then somebody comes up and says something like that. Right? Now, do you think that would install stuff in them? You know? You're a loser! You know? Well, it's interesting and, and is when you look at the elite coaches, maybe they just know this too. You know, they, a guy comes off the field. And now, I just say start watching this, and you'll see who the good coaches are. A guy has a bad play, walks over, puts his arm around him, and try like, don't worry about it. You know? Or whatever they say. You know, now... Those kind of things, and maybe, God willing, the, the young athletes get that when they're young, and maybe that's the other thing that happens, why guys may make it to the pros and others not. Uh, because when you get to certain levels, it's not physical skill. You know, when you get to the guys that are like, you know, the, the I always think of pro baseball, because I've been lucky enough to work with some of them. You know, the AAA guys and the guys in the majors, the actual skill sets aren't that different. They are good athletes, or they wouldn't be where they're at. I think it's the mental thing that will get the guy to the to the majors as opposed to playing triple A, which is it's still pro baseball, but so I mean it's the skill sets up there. So but you'll see it with coaches. And I ask you to start watching that because that's they do more than most of us ever will. You know, I would dare say everybody in this room from the United States, go to the high school football game on Friday night next year. That coach will impact more people than most of us in the room ever will. You know, and it's those hidden things. And maybe you can go work with the coach a little bit, you know. I don't know, but I honestly think that. You know, you go watch the the, the, the teacher, and we just had it this weekend right around here, the teacher that, that coaches the girls' cheerleaders. She impacts more women than most of us ever will. Good, bad, or indifferent, I'm not making any judgments here, I'm just saying, this is the impact stuff, because they're dealing with people in altered states all the time. You know, because competition is an altered state, right? It, it just is. How else can you play a game with a broken hand and not even know it's broken, right? And they really don't, sometimes. 
I, you know, you see people do that stuff, you know? And it doesn't have to be at the pro level. You see it at the, at the, at the other thing. You see people with broken fingers competing in tournaments all the time. You know, it's like, yeah, it's only broke. <laughs> you know, this is the same person, by the way, will take off two weeks from work, you know, because they're having a headache. But this was different. They're in the competition mode now. It's like something switches, you know, and you see it across the board, you know. And we ask people to do this all the time, you know. Um, I'll close with this. You know, since we're in Vegas, land of, of, of what America is all about. No. Right? No. No. Well, it is. This is America at its best. No. Um, uh, in one way, it, it kind of is. No in way. another way, it's the opposite. But, you know, we ask people to do some things we would never normally ask people to do. You know, uh, I'm going to get teary here. But, uh, you know, and we're lucky enough to help people do these things, to overcome these traumatic things, you know. And, and, and I think we've been blessed. You know, when I walk around a place like Vegas, and I see how hard people have to work to survive, and then I think I get paid a lot of money to help people. You know, I've been just blessed from God, you know. And I, I take this very serious. And I think you ought to be out there helping as many people as you physically can. You know, whether it's in groups or personal. And, then, and the same things we just talked about today will come true. You've got to develop some mental toughness. You know, I have 150 people in the room doing a smoking seminar. Sure as heck, there's four or five complete people in the room. I don't want, you know, I'm not sure what part of the, what part of their colon they see when they open their eyes. But it's obvious, it's, it's obvious to me we have a communication gap. But I, you know, I mean, just think about the stuff we get to do, you know. And so it's, it, I think we have been blessed, you know. And I'm, I'm almost done. I will ask this. You did it this morning, so I can do it. Please pray for the United States military yes. and the Canadians. And, 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 and from another country, pray for your military. But it, you know, they give us the ability to be in Las Vegas and live this lifestyle. Yes. And, uh, and we ask them to do this for very little money. We got, you know, some of my friends are still on active duty and things like that. So, uh, you know, it's just something I ask that you do. Just think of them, you know, and do that. But help as many people as you can because the person you help today, you know, may save someone's life later on. You know, you may help somebody today that in six years may save my daughter's life in some other way or friend or whatever it might be. So I honestly believe this stuff to my core. And, you know, and live it. Change your own life. Become a beacon on the hill. You know, we all got baggage. You know, uh, you know, I'm a recovering fundamentalist hillbilly. So we all have that. Okay, you can tell how well my our family reunions went by how many state troopers showed up. Okay, now what I ask that you know, you, whatever your baggage is, fix it. We got the tools. You know, and I'm always fascinated with hypnotists and it, it, that, that they don't do it. They don't do it to themselves. They don't make their own tapes or they don't, place like this, get somebody else's tapes. I mean, I can't listen to my own voice. It drives me crazy. I'm, I'm trying to correct it, you know? But I listen to other people. Laura, I got some of her tapes. I listen to that. You know, Scott McFall, another buddy, you know, or whatever. Switch tapes with people, you know, become a beacon. So for that, my time is about up, and I'd like to thank you. Uh, oh, I'll try. Okay. I don't know if I can do it, then I'll be done. One-handed break. Do you do that? No, one-handed.